Now, as you um, recall, last uh, Sunday morning we shared some introductory thoughts on the theme of the resurrection of Christ. We did that in order to lead into what we want to discover and discuss uh, for a short time today. John chapter 20, of course, brings us the account of some of the incidents where the resurrected Christ appeared to some of his own. And while the main focus in the early part of the chapter is on the actual resurrection of Christ, it is not long before we are led into the encounters that God's people have with the resurrected Christ. And this becomes, as it were, the predominant theme that will continue through to the end of the book, into uh, the next chapter. And over the next few weeks, God willing, we're going to be looking at individuals who had a personal encounter with the risen Christ. And when all is said and done, this is the objective, this is the desire, and this is the purpose of our coming together around the Scriptures, is that we might have a personal interaction with the risen Christ. We're not just here to learn knowledge to build up in our mind, but we're here to feel and to sense and to know the touch of the spiritual where God comes to draw near to us in our times of need. Now there's one interesting and yet important realization that we must reach before we begin to engage our thoughts in this uh, passage this morning. And that is the fact that while there were many witnesses to the resurrection, there were no human witnesses to the actual resurrection of Christ. Now, let me just give you a moment for that to, to uh, fascinate your mind and to engage your heart. No one outside the tomb actually saw or witnessed the resurrection of Christ. It was only after the stone was rolled away, the tomb was opened, the grave clothes were discarded, then, one by one, different individuals began to engage in what becomes a witness to the resurrection. Now, in order to understand that point clearly, we do need to go back a little uh, to the crucifixion. And uh, there we are engaged by the multitudes who assembled to witness the crucifixion. But as we read in the Gospels and as we learn from the various accounts that have been given, we also come to appreciate and understand that while many were there to witness the death of Jesus, they did not view the actual events or what literally took place when Jesus died upon the cross. The Jews and the Romans had their part to play. They were instruments that God used in the process of what was to become the work of Christ on the cross. But ultimately and finally, it was God's work from start to finish. Now, come with me to Isaiah 53. And because I want to bring the five main thoughts to you, I'm not going to labor this point or spend a long time going through these preliminary passages. But just note as you read through Isaiah 53, pick out these salient points. Verse 4. We read of Jesus. He was smitten by God and afflicted. 
Now, where do we see God involved in this, in the process of the crucifixion of Christ? We see the soldiers smiting Jesus. We see the accusations and the ridicule and the mocking and the shame. But there's no mention of God in all of that external involvement. But here the prophet tells us this is really what happened. He was smitten by God and afflicted. Now they took him out and they nailed him to the cross. And we have witness to the agony and the anguish and the shame of all that was entailed in that. But what was actually happening when Jesus was nailed to the cross? Look at verse 6 of Isaiah 53. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, under the surface, while all of these external things were happening, God was doing a work that was unseen by human eye. He was involved in a work of salvation that was largely missed by the crowd who stood around the cross. Look at verse 10. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. So here the prophet tells us whatever was taking place on the surface, there was another work and God was doing that work. That work that no eye could see. That work that was spiritual and eternal and transforming. Look at the reason in verse 10. It was God who made his soul an offering for sin. Verse 11, he bore our iniquities. Verse 12, he bore the sin of many. So while the frenzied work of crucifixion was taking place outwardly, God was doing a quiet work of saving love unseen by human eye. To humanity, it was a slaughter. But to God, it was a sacrifice. And herein lies the mystery of the gospel. So it is when we come to the resurrection. And why is it that those who came to the tomb were witnesses to the resurrection but did not behold the resurrection. Why was it? Because no eye can comprehend the hidden mysteries of God. No man can understand the work that God does. All we see and know are the external features of God's work. The heart of God goes deeper than any mind can imagine. And the work of God is able to perform the greatness of his majesty and his purpose in ways that we could never find out. So in the darkness of the tomb, God in Christ was fulfilling his mighty purpose of grace for his elect people. God was doing his work. Now come with me to First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. And we'll just look for a moment at verses 18. Through to 22. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. Now listen carefully. Here is the work in the resurrection of Jesus that no human eye could see. And no human heart could fully understand. Let's read from verse 18, 1 Peter 3. For Christ also suffered once for sins. The just 
for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Now just note as we go through very quickly, verse 18, he was put to death in the flesh. That's what they did when they nailed him to the cross. Made alive by the Spirit. That's what God did when he was in the tomb. Verse 19. By whom, that is by the Holy Spirit, he preached to the spirits in prison. Now note this little important detail. If you look at verse 18, you will see the word spirit there is headed with a capital. Then come into verse 19, and the spirits in prison, headed by a small s. This is a different spirit. It's one with a small s is the spirit that dwells in your heart and mine. The, the capital S denotes the Holy Spirit. So Christ by the Holy Spirit, went to preach to the spirits of those who were imprisoned. How were they imprisoned? Well, the thief who died upon the cross didn't go to heaven when he died. And Jesus didn't tell him that he would. Jesus simply said to him, Today you shall be with me in paradise. Where was paradise? Paradise was the home of the departed spirits who died in faith, believing in the Messiah, believing in the coming of Christ, the Savior. But heaven was not yet open to them. And their spirits went to the place of paradise, Abraham's bosom. Jesus went and preached to those spirits imprisoned that is they were still held captive they were not in the presence of God but when Jesus died upon the cross what happened he opened the prison doors he led captivity captive he ascended up on high and took with him the spirits of the saints from paradise and now what happens when a believer dies? It is absent from the body and immediately present with the Lord. This mighty work unseen by human eye was being fulfilled when Jesus died upon the cross and was raised again by the Spirit. Now I want you to just... Uh, quickly note, we're going back to John uh, chapter 20. I want you to note uh, these uh, verses, and you don't need to, to look these up. Um, the Trinity were involved in every aspect of the life and the work of Jesus, that is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For example, in the Incarnation, Hebrews 10, 5, we read, A body you have prepared for me. Who prepared the body? God did. God the Father. In Philippians 2 and 7 we read, He made himself of no reputation, that is Jesus, 
the Son. In Luke 1.35, we read of the work of the Holy Spirit. The angel said to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. So in the incarnation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all involved in bringing about the perfection of that mighty work. Now what about the atonement? Isaiah 53, we have already read that the Father laid on him the iniquity of us all. What about Christ the Son? Ephesians 5, 2. Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. Hebrews 9, 4. Who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot unto God. So in the atonement, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all actively engaged. What about the resurrection of Christ from the dead? Romans 6, 4, we read of God the Father, raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. John 10, 17, Jesus said, No man takes my life, I lay it down of myself, that I may take it again. Again in Romans 8, 11, But if the Spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all combined in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now let us make some valuable observations about this happening in the tomb as we now fix our gaze upon the first 10 verses of John chapter 20. I want you to note first of all as we look at um, back into chapter 19 as a lead in on verse 40. John 19 verse 40. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. The first observation is this. Here we have a sacred duty. Now note the words, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now we need to... um, examine this thought a little bit uh, further and to do so I want to take you over to Luke's Gospel chapter 2 Luke's Gospel chapter 2 and here we are back at the Incarnation Now note this. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And then verse 12. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Now, what kind of cloths are swaddling cloths? Well, they're strips of cloth. And the strips of cloth are bound around the body to keep it in shape. Now, if you have had uh, children recently, or your children have had children, and you've gone to visit them, when they are newborns, what is the first thing you notice? You take a look at them, and the first thing you think is, you need to do what Jesus said should be done to Lazarus. Loose him and let him go. See, one of the things you do with a newborn baby is you wrap them now tightly in in, in their clothes. And, And we're told that that makes them feel secure and comfortable and so on. So they're bound tightly. Now, the swaddling clothes were bound or wrapped around the body. So Jesus in the manger in Bethlehem was wrapped in swaddling clothes. Now with that thought 
Come back with me to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Look at verse 39. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. So how was this performed? Well, they took the cloths and the cloths were torn into strips. And the costly spices or ointment was then put on the cloths. And the cloths were then wound around the body of Jesus. Now, do I need to emphasize the point that whether it came from any country, any town, any village across the world, and we laid claim to having found a shroud wrapped around the body of Jesus that left uh, implanted imprints in it when Jesus rose from the dead. Let me take you to this passage of scripture. There was no shroud placed around the body of Jesus, not even the Turin shroud. The body was prepared by the wrapping of these cloths that were imprinted with the ointment that were to preserve the body. And so the mixture of myrrh and aloes was, uh, was put on the body of Jesus. Now come back to Luke chapter 23. Luke 23, verses 55 and 56. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after. Now these were the same women who were at the cross. So they've now come to the tomb. And they observed the tomb and how the body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils. And they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. So they observed two men doing the initial work. That was the custom of the Jews. The women could not become involved in the burial at that particular point. So they went off, prepared their offering in order to return after the Sabbath and to, in a sense, complete the task and we all know why the ladies repeat many of the things that we are supposed to be doing as their husbands because they don't trust us to do it properly or to do it right or to do it well so the women came to make sure that the body of Jesus was properly prepared for burial so that's a sacred duty but I want you to note the second thought And here now in verse 1 of John 20, we have a special day. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early. We read in the last chapter of Luke's Gospel how that um, they rested on the Sabbath. They, They could not become involved with the dead on the Sabbath. It would have broken Sabbatic laws. And so they now wait until the break of day on the new day, the first day of the week, and they come rushing to fulfill their obligations at the tomb. But remember that on the cross Christ had cried, It is finished. All of the requirements of the law had been fulfilled. He has sealed the new covenant with his own blood. 
And now he is about to consecrate the first day of the week as the day of worship for the Christian church. Let's forget about supposed history. Let's forget about man-made rules and regulations. The accusation has been made that the first day of the week was chosen by an early pope and introduced into the church and it became a tradition. That's why we, work, we worship on the wrong day. But what does the Bible say about the first day of the week? Come with me to Psalm 118. Psalm 118. Verses 21 through to 24. I will praise you, for you have answered me and become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected, that's the crucifixion, has become the chief cornerstone. That's the resurrection. That's the foundation that God has laid for our salvation that no other man can lay. Now we read, this was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Now take note of verse 24. This is the day. Now what is the psalmist referring to? He's referring to that day recorded in the earlier verse, the day of resurrection. The day in which Jesus was appointed the chief corner stone. Now we read, this is the day. The Lord has made, and that word made ought to be translated from the original appointed. This is the day the Lord has appointed. So, okay, if that is the case, then what day do we meet for worship? The Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, or the first day of the week being the day of resurrection, the day, the Lord's day. What day do we meet for worship? Look at the next part of verse 24. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. That's why we gather in church on the Lord's day, the first day of the week, to worship God. Not because of tradition, but because of truth. And here we find it stamped into uh, our church theology by this verse 1 of chapter 20 of John's Gospel. Now on the first day of the week Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So here now we have the third observation. We now have a surprising discovery. So we have a sacred duty, we have a special day and now we have a surprising discovery. The stone had been rolled away from the tomb. Now come back with me to chapter 27 of Matthew's Gospel. Matthew 27. Uh, and uh, we want to just read verses 62 through to 66 as we pick up how the stone was actually sealed and why it was sealed uh, to cover the tomb. Matthew 27, verse 62 to 66. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember, while he was still alive, how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure 
until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead, so that the last deception will be worse than the first. You see, the Jews had a belief that for three days the Spirit hovered around the body of the deceased. And at any point within those three days, the Spirit could return to the body. That is why Jesus did not come to Mary and Martha when their brother Lazarus died. He did not come until the fourth day. Because by the fourth day, the body had already begun its decay. And in Jewish traditional custom and, and, and faith, it was now too late. The three days had passed. So here is that superstition now being applied to the death of Jesus. Make sure that no one can get into the tomb until three days have passed. Because he said, in the third day I'm going to rise from the dead. So they set about making it secure. And, and coming down through, we read verse uh, 65, Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So this is the maximum, maximum prison. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. No way, no way is anyone going to move that stone until uh, permission has been given by the authorities. So they seal the stone. Now, if you go back over to John chapter 11 and just take a little look at uh, the death of Lazarus. John chapter 11. Look at verse 38. Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. That's the tomb of Lazarus. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. It wasn't sealed. A stone simply lay against it. That was in order to keep wild beasts from entering in <clears throat> and desecrating the body. So they would lay a stone against it. Now look at verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. So it wasn't a big deal. They simply laid the stone in the mouth of the cave to keep the wild animals out. And then they removed it when Jesus gave them that instruction. But see what happens when they come to the tomb in John chapter 20 and verse 1. And saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now we ask, how was the stone that had been sealed against the mouth of the tomb, how was it taken away? Well, come with me to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Look at verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. See, the earthquake didn't remove the stone. But the visit of the angel caused the earthquake. And the earthquake removed the stone. You see, God can work any miracle to perform his will. He can create an atmosphere in the heavens or in the earth. 
He can move nature itself to do his word and his will. And so the earthquake came and the stone was rolled away. And look what happens down in verse 4 of uh, Matthew 28. And the guard shook <clears throat> for fear of the earthquake. No, no, not the earthquake. For fear of him, and they became like dead men. See, that's what happened to the guards who had spent a lot of time and effort sealing and securing the stone against the tomb. And in just one moment, all of their work is of naught as the angel rolls away the stone. How good were the guards in the presence of omnipotence. Now come back to chapter 20. And the question we have to ask is, why did God remove the stone? Look at verse 19 of John chapter 20. <clears throat> then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Now here is the risen Christ. The disciples are behind locked or sealed doors. Jesus didn't have to open the door in order to go into the upper room. He simply appeared in the presence of the disciples behind the locked doors. The doors were still locked. So Jesus could have come out of the tomb without needing to roll away the stone. But then who would have known that he had risen from the dead? In terms of those who were observing and keeping watch of the tomb, there was a reason. Why did the stone, why was the stone moved? It was God the Father, we know, who had imprisoned Christ in death. And he alone can justify the resurrection of the one who is now counted worthy of that sacrifice. God raised him from the dead and God released him from the tomb. And in the moving of the stone, we have the demonstration on one hand to those who were unbelieving that this was not a secret mission to steal the body of Jesus and then to confirm to those of his disciples that he was indeed risen from the dead we begin to see the proofs of that resurrection now here we want to come to another part and for this we come down to verses 6 and 7. We have Mary rushing back to tell Peter and John uh, what she has witnessed. They come rushing to the, um, to the tomb uh, and um, now we pick up at verse 6 and 7. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Now why labor that point? Here we have the body of Jesus gone. And in its place, Lying on the floor, we have these swaddling bands or these cloths that still have the oil, the anointing oil upon them. And they are lying there on the floor. But there is one that has been removed. It's referred to here in the New King James as a handkerchief. The actual literal word would be better, napkin. And this napkin 
would be placed over the face or around the head of the deceased. Why was it lying separately? And why was it folded? The others were as though they had been discarded, no longer necessary, no longer used. And they were left there lying on the floor. But this napkin has been deliberately placed, positioned, and it's folded. What lesson can we learn from this? Well, it was the custom when the family sat down for a meal that the servant would stand somewhere in the shadows of the room or somewhere to the side where they would be almost unnoticed and they would not disturb the conversation or the meal that had been provided. The man of the house, the father, would sit at the head of the table as they engaged in their meal. As soon as the meal had ended and they were finished and they were going to retire elsewhere for the rest of the day, the head of the home would take his napkin and he would scrunch it up and toss it on the table. That simply meant, we're finished, we're gone. You can now attend to tidying up the table. But if the head of the family, for some reason, needed to leave the table, but was going to return, the meal was not finished, he would take his napkin and he would fold it and he would set it down beside his plate on the table. And the servant knew that if the napkin was folded beside the plate, it simply meant, I'm not finished yet. I will be coming back. I will return. And the servant would simply stand and wait. Jesus sent a message to his disciples, I'm not finished yet. I've been crucified on the cross. They've done all they could to ensure that my work would not satisfy the demands of a holy God. But I will return, risen triumphantly from the grave. And Jesus returned, and his disciples saw him. They knew him. His work was not finished. But let me take you a little step further. In John chapter 21, look at verse 9 to 13. John 21, 9 to 13. And as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. And Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Then Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and likewise the fish. And then he engages in conversation with Peter, and we'll be looking at this when we come into this chapter. But here is the final thought. Just come back over to Luke 24. Luke 24. In verse 41 to 43, we read of Jesus having a meal with his disciples. This is the resurrected Christ. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they give him a piece of a broiled fish and some honey, and he took it and ate in their presence. Now come down to verse 50. 
And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. I'm going to take you into a little thought. Let me emphasize that we're not told this in the Bible. So don't go out and say that I was preaching something that's not in the Bible. But let me share this little thought with you. Jesus had his final meal with his disciples. It was just immediately following that he would be taken up into heaven, departing from them. I wonder how Jesus dealt with his napkin when he'd finished the meal. Did he scrunch it up and throw it on the table? Or did he fold it? Remember what he said in John 14. If I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. Jesus has gone back to heaven but he hasn't finished yet. He is coming back. He is here, the living Christ, with us every moment of every day. But one day, faith will burst into reality and we will see him when he comes. Jesus is coming again. And then, come back to verse 2 of chapter 20 of John. The final thought, we have a startling disappearance. They saw an empty tomb. In Luke 24, verse 3, we read, Then they went in and did not find the body of Jesus. Why? Well, the angel explains, but here it is, as we conclude. Here it is, simply expressed. The angel said, There's no need to look for the living among the dead. You want to see the bones of Muhammad, go to his tomb. You want to see the bones of Buddha, go to his grave. You want to see the bones of Jesus, you won't find them in any tomb in Israel. He is risen. He is alive. He is here. He is in heaven. And one day we will be united whether it is through the valley of the shadow of death, whether it is through the grave, or whether we are alive when Christ returns, it matters not. One thing is sure. Nothing can ever separate us from his love. Therefore, nothing can ever separate us from him. Is that your assurance today? Let us pray. Our loving Father, we can say today with grateful hearts, I know that Jesus lives because he lives within my heart. We pray that all present and all who listen in to this broadcast will be able to identify with that truth. For we know that the tomb is empty, the throne is occupied, And one day Jesus will come for his own. Help us to keep on watching and praying. To be observant, to be working. In order that when he comes, we will meet him and we will be like him. We pray in our Saviour's name. Amen.